Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I'm just gonna stop you real quick before we get started with tonight's story and let you all know about Momocon that's happening at the end of this month. In Atlanta, Georgia, from May 23rd through the 26th, I will be at Momocon along with Muji and Matt. Anybody remembers Matt? We used to live stream together. And we're also in the Dungeon Runners podcast. If anyone's going to be in the area around Momocon, I strongly suggest you come check out the show because it's one of the few times I get a chance to perform alongside Muji. And we're going to be telling scary stories, doing a couple of big game shows and things like that, like I always love to do. Also, I'm going to let you guys know about this because actually I'm not too sure how many of you guys saw, but I got married about two years ago and my wife started up something and I'm going to tell you all about it because I want to be a good husband. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea that you're going to see on your screen in just a second, is my wife's shop. She sells tea on the internet. Different mixed blends of herbal teas and black teas, and they're all themed to Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm hoping one day I can talk her into doing creepy pasta teas, because wouldn't that just be lovely? If you guys would like to enjoy a nice hot tea while you're listening to any creepy pasta stories, I'd really suggest you check out her shop. Okay, that's all for me. Thanks for listening, guys. And sweet dreams. Sociology always fascinated me, and after decades of writing books and being a professor, I was lucky to become part of a team funded by very important corporations to create a daring experiment. We wanted to know what happens when you isolate a common family from the entire world. The structure for the study was amazing, courtesy of a very high budget. We had an entire house built inside the facilities, and did a few long, meticulous interviews to select our subjects. The Smiths were a typical suburban family of four. Father, Regis Smith, had recently lost his job. He had two teenagers, Maya and George, and his wife, Sandra, had never once worked in her life, so he was pretty desperate to get in. They were selected over a second family that met all our expectations because they had no other living relatives. Both Regis and Sandra were only children, and both their parents had passed. They also had no close friends, nor did their children. The sponsors urged us to believe that we saved a family from being homeless. But every time I remember what happened, I believe it less and less. Here are the most relevant parts of the log that we researchers collectively kept. We took turns surveying the subjects 24 hours per day, and in every room of the house, There were three eight-hour shifts, each including a sociologist, a psychiatrist, and a few assistants. I may have inserted a few extra pieces of information to help you understand better the whole story. Also, we call the subjects by numbers to avoid humanizing them too much, but... But I'm transcribing their real names. And in time, you'll understand why. Day one. They're all quiet and awkward, too aware of the monitoring to do anything normal. All four of them mostly just sit around uncomfortably. The subjects have access to the internet to keep a sense of normalcy, but since they have to be isolated from the world, they can't post on social media or comment on sites, only use it to read news, books, and the like. Their internet use is being remotely monitored by texts related to our team, and can be terminated forever at any time if they break the rules. Day two, Maya woke up screaming from a nightmare. The subjects are slowly adjusting. The monitor is very subtle and the countless cameras and mics are very well hidden. So it's easy to forget they're there. Especially with your family around, I suppose. Day three, one of the cameras malfunctioned yesterday and I had someone go in and change it without being seen, but today the image is all black again. It's a mere closet and the Subjects don't know this part of the house is monitoring free, so maybe there's no real need to change a second time. At least the microphone still works. To keep a sense of normalcy, we ask the adults to make a few daily tasks. Besides cleaning and cooking, they have to homeschool their kids, make a grocery list, clean a car that never leaves the garage but is constantly being dirtied by one of the assistants, and at least one of them should keep a remote job. 
They also have to wake up early every day like they would in the outside world. This has put a huge stress on George, who's clearly a night owl and a bad sleeper in general. Day 6. Sandra and Regis are fighting the whole time. He tried to delegate the tasks, but she called him controlling. She wants to homeschool the kids, but he says that she's dumb as a door. She offers to have a job then, but he says she's only good at household chores. Sandra's pretty hurt. And mad. Day 9. Maya went to the grocery room. A separate room of the house where one of the assistants puts food and basic home supplies once a week, and spent 45 minutes talking to herself. All of them picked up this habit around day 4. The house is not big enough for them to have a lot of privacy, and everyone is bothered by each other's constant presence. This is getting interesting. Maya mumbled precisely 103 times. It's unbearable that Dad never leaves. It's unbearable that Dad never leaves. It's unbearable that Dad never leaves. Day 16. George has been having more trouble than usual with sleeping. He moves too much in the bed, and then he wakes up tired, in a cold sweat. He loses focus while studying, only his sister seems to notice that he has a problem. We'll leave this place eventually, right? The 13-year-old boy asked his older sister. I really want to go to college one day. She says, sure, don't be silly. Day 23. Regis isolated himself from the family. Focusing on his work, he builds furniture and wooden pieces on demand, obviously our fake demand. His work is very noisy, and it's clearly driving everyone else crazy. He's the only one who seems to be happy, or at least not stressed all the time. He and Sandra are alternating between screaming at each other and completely ignoring each other. But despite the fight, most nights in bed he looks for her in the dark. Her size suggests she only wants the semi-consented at best sex to end, but it doesn't seem to bother him at all. Dr. Ivano, my assigned fellow psychiatrist, thinks that he even enjoys it. Now, she clearly doesn't want him to touch her, but has no way to say no. What a scary man is Regis. I'm excited to know who he really is when the social paranoia he puts on is in shatters. I'm convinced that there's still something more, something darker. Day 38, everything was going relatively fine, I should say eventless until George woke up once again in a sweat and trembling. Without notice, he simply got up, went to the kitchen, and and cut his wrist. The knife was too sharp, and his hand ended up dangling from the arm, only a piece of skin avoiding that it got completely detached. Sandra was the one who found him, collapsed on the kitchen floor. She did nothing but scream, looking at a direction that she thought to be a camera. You're killing us! You're psychos! Maya, quite the practical one, went to the grocery room where we had always provided a good first aid kit, painkillers and antibiotics to help deal with the trauma and pay relieve the pain. We're not that bad. She sedated her brother, cleaned the wound, and clumsily sewed his hand back, then bandaged the whole thing. It was a decent job for a 15 year old. I was proud of her, like God was proud after creating Adam. Day 39, once again Sandra is screaming at a supposed camera. You need to provide medical care for my son. He needs a psychological evaluation and antidepressants. Sorry, Sandra. Point is observing your family with no contact with another human being. Besides, he's being evaluated. We just can't tell him the diagnosis. Our silence seemed to kill her inside. Pointing her finger at the wrong direction, she added, You need to do something or I will. Day 42. Sandra tried to contact a psychiatrist online, and had to be put in the solitary for a week. Her access to the internet is terminated for life. No more fantasizing about ethical males and thongs for you, my lady. Only browsing through recipes just to realize in the next grocery day that one ingredient will always be missing. After all, we have to keep normalcy. Minor annoyances happen every day. She keeps screaming at us. How long will you keep us here? Six months? A year? I can't stand another week in this hell. Day 48. Regis was cranky and borderline abusive with his kids the entire week. This is the first time he addressed us. How am I supposed to not fuck for a week, you sick fucks? Are you enjoying my misery? This crap is over. I want to give up. I'll contact my lawyer. But he never did. He may have power over his wife. 
but he can't do shit to us, and that makes me smile. We don't enjoy human misery, Regis, but we enjoy yours. Besides, he's our most interesting subject. Day 49. Sandra was hysterical for the week, but calmed down once Maya went to the grocery room and brought a fair amount of booze. We only give them alcohol on special occasions. Christmas was coming up. Cigarettes and drugs were strictly banned. Sandra kept all the alcohol for herself, demanding that her daughter keep it a secret from the boys. Her addiction made it easier to get through the next month. Too bad for her that the stock had ended. Day 26. George tried to end it all by setting the house on fire. Our fire alarm is very good. Beside a few second-degree burns on his former good hand and a wet house, nothing happened. He claims to miss a girl named Karina. We imagine that she's a school crush. Sandra started to change. She sent Regis to sleep in his small workshop. He slapped her on the face so hard that she was bruised for a week, but she didn't back off. He was too surprised to do anything else before she shoved him out of the door. You can see that this man is very used to resorting to physical punishment to get what he wanted from the weaker, and the only reason why it took this long for us to see him in action was that his family already knew better, and did everything to avoid his fury. Day 70. Sandra told Maya, we girls gotta stay together. Maya's not interested in being anybody's ally. She seems to do better alone. We had to change the closet camera again because George has been spending more and more time there. Now instead of static, all you can see is darkness, a reddish darkness, like, like when you close your eyes in a sunny day. She probably put one camera out of the closet, but facing it. Maya asked who is Karina, but George won't answer. Day 73. George... is gone. Yesterday, all the cameras in his room malfunctioned. You could only hear sounds, he was talking alone, we're sure of it, because all the others were being seen in different rooms, but he... he was distressed like someone having a heated argument. No, I won't kill Dr. Chardon, were his last words. Before a loud series of bangs started, Maya rushed up to his room and screamed, No, George, please, please, stop hurting yourself, please, please. You could hear her loud crying as her parents approached the room. The cameras went black. Then back to normal except for the one in the closet and George. It was a dreadful sight. His whole head was ripped open with blood and brains staining the closet door, the floor, and his sister. He was barely recognizable as human. Looked like a pumpkin ran over by a truck. He banged his head so strongly, Maya said. He killed himself in an awful way. Awful, awful way. For the first time since the experiment started, I grabbed the only microphone that could be heard inside the house. Lock yourselves in rooms immediately. We are removing George. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you all thank you so much for listening to tonight's story, or watching tonight's story if you're on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, that means you're probably on the podcast that's available on iTunes, on the Google Play Store, and is now actually available on Spotify and doesn't use as much data. So, hey, that's a thing. If you guys aren't listening on YouTube or Spotify, then I have no idea how else you could have found me. Unless you found one of those books on Amazon. You know, the Creepypasta Collection, Volume 1, Volume 2. Those are things, too. Oh, well. I don't know how you would have heard me there, seeing as this was recorded, like, two years after those came out. Uh. Well, anyway. Thanks for listening, folks. And sweet dreams. <laughs>